Faisal ibn Abdul Aziz al Saud was born in the royal house of Saud. He was the third son of King Abdul Aziz, the founder of modern day Saudi Arabia. Faisal's date of birth is not officially confirmed, as birth certificates were unavailable in the region of Hejaz at that time. However, some have estimated that he may have been born in the year 1905. Faisal is an old traditional Arabic name meaning sword. He spent much of his early years under the attentive guardianship of his maternal grandfather. His grandfather molded his character and influenced his personality in a very profound way. From a very young age, Faisal's mother would habitually encourage and motivate him to cultivate and develop the proud nomadic traits of courage, generosity, and above all else, religious piety and sincerity. But the loving inspiration and maternal cheer that the young prince was so accustomed to in these early years were to be disrupted prematurely. When his beloved mother died in the year 1912, Faisal was only seven years old at that time. Like a delicate but precious pearl, washed up on the desolate shores of grief and separation, overwhelmed by sweeping tides of orphanage, the young prince soon found solace and serenity under the care of his maternal grandfather, who was an inspiration and a mentor for the tender soul. During his early years, under the tutelage and guidance of his grandfather, Prince Faisal had learned to read the Noble Quran and began studying the principles of Islam away from the distractions and comforts of his father's royal halls and magnificent palaces. The pure environment beneath the open skies of the desert terrain in which Faisal grew up during his formative years would slowly ingrain delicate but deep ties to the desert life and would leave indelible marks upon the impressionable mind of the young prince. Prince Faisal's experience was remarkable because unlike his brothers, he had lived with desert dwellers and was learned in the traditions. He knew their dialects and understood the subtleties of classical Arabic poetry. Faisal's childhood experience in the open desert enabled him to learn how to ride horses, how to hunt with falcons, how to shoot rifles, and even how to handle swords. In addition to these useful abilities, Faisal's uncles taught him military strategies and tactics, as well as customs and histories of the Arab tribes surrounding them. He was well versed in their heritage he knew about their blood feuds. He even learned to recognize their grazing patterns. Above all, the young prince was an ardent apprentice of desert diplomacy, a skill which he had come to learn directly under his father, King Abdul Aziz, the unrivaled champion. Consequently, these early experiences would serve the young prince a great deal in later years.
Prince Faisal was a unique product of the untainted environment of an open desert. As a son of the soil, he understood the common dialects of his people and participated in everyday activities, from herding camels to shooting arrows in the wilderness. Faisal had surpassed his brothers in many respects and was perhaps one of the king's most promising children. This was a sentiment that was evident from the king's own expressions. King Abdul Aziz would often make the following remark concerning his third son. Oh, I only wish I had three Faisals. Faisal's brilliance and natural intelligence would soon be tested when in 1919 the British government invited King Abdul Aziz to visit London on a diplomatic mission. However, with the recent death of his older son and with concerns over the domestic situation, the king sent his 14-year-old son, Faisal, to represent him. This diplomatic assignment made Faisal the very first Saudi royal to visit the United Kingdom. He travelled with a cousin who was raised in Turkey, along with a merchant who spoke English. They were all accompanied by several guards. Yet despite his new surroundings and the alien culture that engrossed his 14-year-old mind, Faisal had not forgotten his upbringing back in the desert of Arabia. The morning following his arrival in the United Kingdom, Prince Faisal and his entourage were forcefully removed from their hotel room. After having made the morning call to prayers, thereby waking up the entire hotel, Faisal spent all but five months in Britain, wherein he met with the king and high-ranking British officials. During the same period, he also visited France, where he was saluted as the first Saudi royal to visit there also. Furthermore, during his stay in Britain, King George invited Prince Faisal and his entourage to Buckingham Palace in the spirit of hospitality. However, when he was asked what he liked most about the country, the young prince replied that he particularly enjoyed riding up and down the long escalators in Piccadilly Circus. The teenager learned a few phrases in English and gained a fresh new insight into the world outside the Desert Kingdom. In fact, he became the country's de facto foreign minister at the age of 14, and he continued to serve in that capacity until the day he died. <laughs> Upon the death of King Abdul Aziz and the succession of Prince Faisal's elder brother, King Saud, in 1953, Prince Faisal was subsequently appointed Crown Prince. But in 1958, Due to growing unrest concerning the new king's financial ineptitude, many members of the royal family, along with senior members of the religious establishment, were actively calling for the appointment of Prince Faisal to the office of Prime Minister, thereby endorsing the motion that Prince Faisal should be granted wide executive powers to support his elder brother with decision-making. Once appointed to the rank of Prime Minister, Prince Faisal initiated a massive reform that dramatically reduced unnecessary expenditure and lavish projects within the kingdom. Faisal had diligently worked to rescue the state treasury from bankruptcy. His policy of financial conservativeness was to become a symbol of his good judgment and earned him a reputation for prudence and moderation. However, not long after his appointment, Prince Faisal was at the centre of a power struggle between himself and the reigning monarch, King Saud. But on the 18th of December, 1960, Prince Faisal resigned as Prime Minister, expressing his concern that King Saud was jeopardizing his financial reform and reversing the positive impact of his policies. King Saud therefore revoked Faisal's executive powers and appointed his other brother, Prince Talal, 
to the executive post of finance minister. However, by 1962, Prince Faisal had rallied enough support within the royal family to reinstall himself as prime minister for a second time. And during his second term as prime minister, Prince Faisal was successful in being able to cement his reputation as a reformer and an agent for development and modernization within the kingdom. Prince Faisal was the first Saudi monarch to introduce female education, despite the consternation of many conservatives in the traditional institutions. He challenged the social norms and championed the calls for women to achieve proficiency in reading, writing, and arithmetic. A delegation of objectors soon approached Prince Faisal in an attempt to revoke his plans towards female education in the kingdom. Their concerns were rebuffed by Faisal's bold challenge to present just one verse in the Quran wherein women were forbidden to read and write. Prince Faisal's own wife was deeply involved in championing the cause for female education. Prince Faisal also supported the establishment of the Islamic University of Medina in 1961. And in 1962, he also championed the establishment of the Muslim World League organization. In November 1964, Prince Faisal was designated to the throne in favor of his elder brother, the former King Saud. But Prince Faisal is reported to have refused the honor three times until it was eventually forced upon him. In a passionate inaugural ceremony, following his royal appointment on November the 2nd, 1964, King Faisal declared the following words, I beg of you brothers to look upon me as a brother and a servant. Majesty is reserved for God alone, and the throne is the throne of the heavens and earth. Upon his ascension, King Faisal still viewed the restoration of the country's finances as his main priority. He continued to pursue his judicious financial policies during the first years of his reign, and his aims of balancing the country's budget eventually succeeded and were further advanced by an increase in oil production. King Faisal now embarked on a full-blown modernization program. The peak of his achievements was the establishment of a judicial system. Many universities were established or expanded during his rule. Many of the country's current ministries, government agencies and welfare programs were established during his rule. He invested heavily in infrastructure. He also introduced policies such as agricultural and industrial subsidies, as well as pension plans and social insurance programs for the Saudi workforce. When King Faisal ascended to the throne, there were only 317 real in the World Treasury Vault a measly sum of little over 50 US dollars. So the king initiated a sweeping program that would limit and minimize excessive allowances being paid to members of the royal family at the expense of the public. As a result of these courageous initiatives and measures, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia was now on the road to financial stability and prosperity. King Faisal built many schools and established several mosques he even dug wells in the Bedouin region and spent his own money towards settling debts and medical bills of local merchants and tribesmen. In fact, King Faisal spent 50 times more towards the educational budget in one year than had been previously spent by the administration before him. Then in 1964, King Faisal hired the National Broadcast Company, better known as NBC, to set up four TV stations in Riyadh, Jeddah, Medina and Amman. 
The first television broadcasts were officially transmitted in July 1965. But in 1966, an especially zealous nephew of King Faisal, by the name of Khalid ibn Musaid, led a group of armed protesters in an attempt to destroy the television station in Riyadh. King Faisal had informed the officers to retaliate if the prince should open fire, reminding everyone that no one was above the law, not even a prince. When the police arrived to disperse the group, Prince Khalid shot at the security guard and was himself consequently shot in retaliation and self-defense. The prince eventually died from the bullet wound. This incident would become a key trigger to a very tragic incident that would unfold 10 years later. Yet despite the growing and relentless opposition movement from conservative factions within the kingdom, King Faisal continued to pursue his objectives and would always defend his policies by referring back to sound Islamic principles. However, unlike many of his contemporaries, King Faisal readily acknowledged his country's religious and cultural diversity, which included the predominantly Shia region of Ahsa in the east and the southwestern region of Asir. King Faisal's policies were inclusive and applied equally to the various religious subgroups and denominations. However, the dark stain of slavery was yet to vanish from the desert kingdom, and on November the 6th, 1962, the institution of slavery was totally abolished in Saudi Arabia. King Faisal had long felt such conviction about this cause. He previously stunned the American establishment upon visiting President Roosevelt in 1943, when he emphatically insisted that his black assistants should be seated on the same table and eat the same food that was being served to him in an area of the restaurant that was reserved for white people only. In an era of enthusiastic Arab nationalism and popular communist revolt, King Faisal was defiantly anti-communist. He rejected all political advances from the Soviet bloc, declaring that Islam is completely incompatible with the godless tenets of communism. King Faisal associated communism with Zionism, an ideology which he also criticized sharply. Could I ask His Majesty what sequence of events he would like to see now in the Middle East? King Faisal was an active advocate for Islamic unity. He sought to counter the influence of socialism and Arab nationalism within the region. <laughs> King Faisal was an ardent advocate for the Palestinian struggle. He used his authority and political voice to advance the message at an international level. In his famous speech delivered at the UN in 1947, the king addressed the Western audience with the following proposition. If you want to be generous, then be generous with what you possess. He then urged the West not to treat the Palestinians as if that country had no owners and as if her rightful inhabitant had no say in the matter. But for all his bravery on behalf of the Palestinians, King Faisal was insulted, shoved, booed and spat upon by Jewish demonstrators in New York. 
هل ننتظر الضمير العالمي أين هو الضمير العالمي إن القدس الشريف يناديكم ويستغيث بكم أيها الإخوة لتنقذوه من محنته ومما ابتلي به فماذا يخيفنا؟ Yet after many diplomatic attempts, coupled with sequential breaches of contract by the US and the UN over the Palestinian affair, King Faisal took matters into his own hands and made it very clear that his concern for the Muslims in Palestine was not a matter of words alone. This is NBC Nightly News, Wednesday, October 17th, reported by John Chancellor. Good evening. The Middle East war produced developments all over the world today. The oil-producing countries of the Arab world decided to use their oil as a political weapon. They will reduce oil production by 5% a month until the Israelis withdraw from occupied territories. If the Arab countries keep that pledge, it would reduce their production by almost 50% in one year. There were diplomatic maneuvers at the United Nations, in Washington, and in Cairo. Soon the Western world would stop taking oil for granted. And in October 1973, when the Arab-Israeli war began, King Faisal withdrew Saudi oil from the world markets as a strong sign of protest over the West's unrelenting and shameful support for Israel. King Faisal led the Arab oil embargo of 1973. This affirmative strategy increased the price of oil and was the primary contributing factor behind the 1973 energy crisis. It was to be the defining act of King Faisal's career, an act that gained him lasting prestige among many Muslims worldwide. What does Nixon do? He orders Kissinger, Secretary of State, and Schlesinger, Secretary of Defense, to prepare to take over the Arab oil fields in Saudi Arabia. And by 1974, he was named Time Magazine's Man of the Year. The financial windfall generated by the oil crisis fueled the financial stream that continues to flow into the Saudi economy long after his death. However, following the defeat of the Arab forces in 1973, towards the end of the Arab-Israeli war, King Faisal was never seen to smile publicly again due to his grief and his deep sadness over the state of Palestine and the loss of land inflicted on the indigenous people of Palestine. The king thus encouraged Muslims to rise up and liberate the Holy Land in an emotional speech. In the Quds al-Sharif, you nadikum wa yastaghiz bukum ayyuha al-ikhwa. King Faisal was respected and highly regarded by his peers and contemporaries. He had invited Malcolm X to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia as a guest of the state and accorded him a generous and honorable reception for the duration of his pilgrimage in the Holy Land. King Faisal also developed a close alliance with Pakistan where he was regarded highly for his religious policies and his Islamic ideals. He was a very close friend of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, the renowned Prime Minister of Pakistan, as well as General Mohammed Zia ul Haq. In fact, in 1979, Lialpur, which is Pakistan's third largest city, was renamed Faisalabad, which means the city of Faisal. This was in honor of the legacy of the King of Saudi Arabia. King Faisal's personal life was unique compared to that of his predecessors and to many of his contemporaries. King Faisal was monogamous all of his life and was married to Queen Efat. She was a very educated young woman whom he had met in Turkey. She was in fact fluent in French and was a very confident personality. She was the first Saudi woman to be named Queen. Together, they had championed the education of females 
having established the very first female schools in the kingdom. King Faisal's daily routine was very consistent. He would wake up early for prayers and would kneel down with his servants in prostration before God. He habitually instructed people to address him as Brother Faisal instead of His Royal Highness. King Faisal also had witnessed much of the outside world during his lifetime. He took English lessons and understood it enough to be able to correct his translators during interviews. Yet despite this ability, he preferred to communicate in Arabic. He was a deep reader and would station himself behind his desk consuming information sometimes six or seven days in a row. He never lost his composure and was known to say, God gave us two ears and one tongue that we should listen twice as much as we talk. And by the end of 1974, Times Magazine named King Faisal its Man of the Year. Reporters described him as dour, ascetic and shrewd. But within days of this article having been printed, King Faisal reportedly had two distinctive dreams that were to prove true in the following months. In one of his dreams, he was informed by his grandfather that it was time to meet his mother, who had died when he was only seven years old. In his second dream, he saw his grandfather, his sister, and his eldest brother. All of them had forced him into a car and drove away. Upon relating his dreams to his aunt, he had expressed a concern that he did not think he would live to see the end of the new year. وأرجو الله سبحانه وتعالى أنه إذا كتب لي الموت أن يكتب لي الموت شهيدا في سبيل الله إخواني On March the 25th, 1975, King Faisal arrived in his office at 10.25 a.m. He had an appointment to meet Kuwait's new oil minister who was waiting in a side room next to the king's office. Along with him was also the Saudi finance minister, Zaki al-Yamani, and along with them was a young Saudi prince who snuck into the waiting room with the two senior officers. When the door to King Faisal's office was opened at 10.32 a.m., the young prince walked in behind the two ministers. And when King Faisal leaned over to embrace his young nephew, at that very moment, the young man took out a pistol and shot six rounds at close range. The first shot hit the king's chin, piercing his throat and ripping through his jugular vein. The second bullet went through his ear and grazed his temple. The king's dream had now come to light. He was assassinated by his own nephew. King Faisal was quickly taken to hospital. He was still alive as doctors massaged his heart and gave him a blood transfusion. However, due to the severity of the injuries, the doctors were not successful in their operation and King Faisal died shortly thereafter. It is reported that both before and after the shooting, King Faisal remained calm. Later that day, a radio newscaster held back his tears long enough to tell the nation that King Faisal had been brutally assassinated that morning. Following the murder of King Faisal, Riyadh observed three days of mourning and all government activities were at a standstill. The assassin was Prince Faisal al Musaid, a 24 year old graduate returning from the US. He was the younger brother of Khalid al Musaid, the very same prince who was shot dead in 1966. The assassin was captured directly after the attack, and the nation's high court convicted him of murder and had sentenced him to death, despite the king's dying request that the life of his assassin should be spared. Yet within Saudi Arabia and in the wider Muslim world at large, it is commonly believed that King Faisal's oil boycott was the real cause of his assassination and that the young assassin was a willing agent 
acting on behalf of a foreign agency. The Arabs and Muslims in every place. لقد شاركتمونا شاركتمونا العزاء بفقيدنا الغالي الفيصل بن عبد العزيز رحمه الله واسكنه فسيح جناته King Faisal's body was buried a day following his death he was laid to rest in an unmarked grave at Al Oud cemetery in Riyadh on March 26 1975 His legacy burns bright in the heart of every Saudi citizen and his valiant call for justice rings throughout the Muslim world. King Faisal's sincere call for a unified Muslim world based upon one book, one identity, under one God will one day be realized by the true inheritors of his struggle. King Faisal ibn Abdul Aziz al Saud was a reformer a liberator and a champion for female education. He was a courageous defender for the Palestinian cause. He lived as he died, upon principles and upon deep conviction. He loved his Muslim brothers and did his best to create a better society for his own people. May Allah grant King Faisal al Saud a spacious dwelling place in paradise and reward him for his struggles upon the path to Islamic unity. Ikhwani, ماذا ننتظر؟ هل ننتظر الضمير العالمي؟ أين هو الضمير العالمي؟ إن القدس الشريف يناديكم. ويستغيث بكم أيها الإخوة لتنقذوه من محنته ومن مبتلي به فماذا يخيفنا هل نخشى الموت وهل هناك موتة أفضل وأكرم من أن يموت الإنسان مجاهدا في سبيل الله أيها الأخوة المسلمون نريدها قومة ونهضة إسلامية لا تدخلها قومية ولا عنصرية ولا حزبية إنما دعوة إسلامية دعوة إلى الجهاد في سبيل الله في سبيل ديننا وعقيدتنا دفاعا عن مقدساتنا وحرماتنا وأرجو الله سبحانه وتعالى أنه إذا كتب لي الموت أن يكتب لي الموت شهيدا في سبيل الله إخواني أرجو أن تعذروني إذا ارتج علي فإنني حينما أتذكر هرمنا الشريف ومقدساتنا تنتهك وتستباح وتمثل فيها المخادي والمعاصي والانحلال الخلقي فإني أدعو الله مخلصا إذا لم يكتب لنا الجهاد وتخليص هذه المقدسات ألا يبقيني لحظة واحدة على الحياة من المؤمنين رجال صدقوا ما عاهدوا الله عليه فمنهم من قضى نحبه ومنهم من ينتظر وما بدلوا تبديلا رحمك الله يا فيصل رحمة الأبرار
Ready up. Uh.